Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, my doctorate is um, from Carnegie Mellon uh, a fairly long time ago. Um, and, um, and being at Carnegie Mellon in the late 1970s, sort of the, the, hero, he, the intellectual hero on campus was a guy named Herb Simon. Um, who is the father of lots of different fields, depending on who you talk to and how you date things. Um, uh, but but, but a, a major contribution is um, his development to the concept of bounded rationality, elaborated in a book with uh, James March. Um, but this is the work that Simon won his Nobel Prize for. Um, and in simple form, bounded rationality was offered as an alternative to the neo neoclassical assumption of rational action that dominated economics for many decades. And Simon argued that while people want to act rationally, um, they're limited in doing so um, because of cognitive constraints and a variety of, uh, of basically cognitive limitations. So people want to act rationally, but they're limited in how they could do that. Um, and a lot of people would date the field of behavioral economics or behavioral decision research. Uh, Daniel Kahneman's recent book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, for which, uh, which documents work that he won the Nobel Prize for in 2002, but really back to the work of bounded rationality. Um, about a decade ago, Dick Thaler, um, uh, professor at the University of Chicago and, and uh, perhaps a foremost behavioral economist around, um, suggested that um, we could understand the limitations of the human mind if we thought not just about bounded rationality, which was most commonly manifested in the work on decision biases and heuristics, but thinking about two other categories of bounds. And he suggested that people have bounded willpower. Okay? And bounded willpower refers to the situation where you go to a party and in front of you is a big bowl of cashews, um, and you start eating cashews. and um, sort of your short-term self likes cashews and you keep eating cashews, um, but you're imagining the next day you'll be annoyed if you eat the entire bowl. Um, and at some point you do the weird thing of you pick up the bowl when it still has many cashews in it and you move it to the other side of the room so you won't even be tempted. Okay. Um, and, and, and this captures the notion of bounded willpower that we often have sort of an a, a inconsistency between a short-term self and a long-term self and we often fail to maximize our cumulative utility because the short-term self seems to win out on those negotiations more than it um, rationally should. In bounded self-interest, um, uh, many manifestations of, of neoclassical economics suggest that humans are self-interested. And the argument on bounded self-interest is that uh, many of you actually get utility when something good happens to your friend who you're sitting next to or a loved one. Um, and some of you also get joy um, when pain occurs to one of your enemies. So we aren't just interested in our own outcomes. We actually have utility on the outcomes of others. Um, some people find build it, bounded willpower and bounded self-interest to really be parts of bounded rationality. For me, again, that's a semantic. I, I actually like this. Um, and um, what I want to do is talk about some more bounds, okay? And I'm going to talk in short form about bounded awareness. Um, and then I'll be talking about one more bound in just a little bit. Yeah. And one form of bounded awareness is not noticing ethical aspects about the decisions that we're making or the ethical decisions of people around us. And that's what I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on. So bounded ethicality. <coughs> refers to the systematic and predictable ways in which humans act unethically beyond their own awareness. Um, I, I first wrote a paper on this topic with uh, Mazreen Banaji and Dolly Chug in Harvard Business Review in 2003, and last year published a book called Blind Spots with Ann Tenbrunsel um, on this topic um, if you kind of want kind of background reading. And I'm going to be talking about two forms of bounded ethicality. Okay. Boundedness in your own ethicality and boundedness in noticing the ethicality of others. And I want to remind you, I'm not talking about the conscious deliberation of do I do the good thing or the money-making thing. I'm not talking about the conscious <coughs> deliberation to do bad. I'm talking about the ways in which people systematically and predictably um, act unethically without having any intention of doing anything wrong. So I'm going to be talking about 
<coughs> a variety of ways in which we do this. And this will take more of an overview form. And I'll, I'll try to direct you to sort of where you can read more or learn more as you see fit. Um, but certainly, the biggest chunk of work um, on bounded rationality is um, by uh, Greenwald and Banaji on their work on implicit associations or implicit attitudes. Um, if you've never been to this website, um, that may be kind of the best sort of thing that you can get out of this talk. Go to that website, <laughs> implicit.harvard.edu, um, where you can do a variety of computer-based tests that will give you some hint about the degree to which you might be racist or sexist or ageist or homophobic without even any awareness that you have those social preferences. Okay? Um, and basically, these are computer-mediated uh, tests that look at the implicit associations that you have in your mind so that it may be possible to predict racist behavior even though you personally don't believe yourself to be a racist in any way whatsoever. Um, and there's predictive validity, meaning that we can predict actual behavior in terms of how unfriendly people act toward African Americans, how they act toward gay men, how they rate a black author's essay negatively, willingness to cut the budget for Jewish or Asian student organizations, <coughs> opposition to affirmative action, discrimination against female job applicants. Okay? Um, and I should also add that <coughs> there are critics of the whole field of implicit attitudes. Phil Tetlock is a social psychologist who's a noted critic. So this is not something without controversy. But I think that there's pretty good evidence that we do have these implicit associations. Um, in at least many contexts, there's predictive validity connected to them as well. Closely related to implicit associations is the topic of in-group, out-group biases. Okay? Um, so in social psychology, there's a vast literature on the topic of favoritism toward one's in-group. Okay? Doing favors for your in-group and being more negative toward out-groups. Um, and um, one domain that's particularly intriguing, and it's a, repeat, a, a repeated result, um, and, it, and that says over the last decade. I, that should really say uh, over the last almost two decades. Studies have repeatedly shown in the US that banks are much more likely to, de to deny a mortgage to an African American than to a Caucasian, even after you do the appropriate controls for other um, demographic characteristics that might um, predict creditworthiness. Um, and when these studies first started to appear, and the media would write about them, you would clearly have the image that there are white loan officers who are hostile to black applicants. And my good buddy Dave Messick argued in an op-ed that a much more insidious, more difficult problem might be um, that these white loan officers <coughs> might not be hostile to African Americans, but they may have a propensity to do favors for members of their in-group, people who are a whole lot like themselves. Okay. Now, if you have a limited resource, and that could be sort of the number of people who can get admitted to Queen's University, or it could be the amount of money available for mortgages, and you do favors for the in-group, what you end up with is that the out-group is harmed without anybody having any hostility whatsoever. And when the bank loan officer is asked about attitudes towards African Americans, they like African Americans just fine. They have no intent to discriminate. Um, all they did was do favors for their friends. Okay. The other thing that I want to note is that it's rare for someone who's doing a favor for an in-group member to believe that they are doing something unethical. Okay. Rather, they focus on the inconvenience that they're going through to do the favor. They focus on the good that they're doing without thinking about the harm that's occurring in the meantime. As a faculty member, I can tell you that in the spring, 
I find old friends and relatives of relatives who are my relatives who I never knew existed. And they show up in the spring when their children turn 18. <laughs> okay. And there's kind of this notion, you know, we know you can't admit them to Harvard, but surely you know the dean of admissions. Okay. And, um, and imagine, I don't, I, don't, I don't say yes to this, um, but imagine that you want to be a nice person. And you, all you do is arrange for an interview. Are you doing something good or are you doing something bad? And I would argue most people doing the favor would think that they're doing something good when their net effect on society, I would argue, is quite clearly bad. So the question here is why we don't notice when other people around us are acting unethically and we should basically be doing something about it. Okay. Um, and one, argue, one, one part is that, um, that, uh, that we're often motivated to not notice. Okay. So I met with um, accounting professor Soltiero um, earlier today, and he's kind of a kindred spirit in, uh, th there aren't that many people who see the final four accounting firms as evil. Uh, he didn't use the word evil. Um, I, I think that they're evil. Um, um, he's at least highly critical of them, shall we say. And the problem is that we've created a institution called Auditor Independence, which I'm going to quickly say is a fraud. Okay. And it's a fraud because the industry claims to offer a service that it has structured to not offer that very service. Okay. So um, for those of you who have had no accounting, no accounting ever in your life, um, so we might have, ha there might be people who snuck in from the psychology department or something like that. Um, uh, and this idea of auditing is a strange word. Um, in short form, in the US and Canada, most developed economies, we require corporations to have their books audited by a quote unquote independent auditor. Okay? And you probably have heard of Arthur Anderson who kind of went out of business for having some problems with their independence. Um, but PricewaterhouseCoopers, KPMG, et cetera, et cetera. And the problem is that as this industry developed, um, we allowed firms to pick their auditor. We allowed firms to fire their auditor. We allowed auditing firms to sell things other than auditing services, like consulting services at higher profit margins. And we created a career path for auditors to move from audit firms to the corporate client that they were auditing. So the question is, what happens when you're an auditor and there's something wrong with your client's books? Well, in simple form, the reward that you get for noticing is you may lose your audit account. You may lose the consulting services that you're selling at a higher profit margin. And if you're the bright young auditor who notices, you just cut off a potential career path of what job you might take next. So what I'm arguing is that society has created, has, has created with the significant help of lobbying money from the largest auditing firms, a system that costs society a great deal of money, costs corporations a lot of money in order to be audited. <coughs> and the one thing that the current structure can't provide is an independent audit. And I keep on using the word independent. And why is that important? And the simple answer is, if the audit isn't independent and objective, it has no reason to exist. Okay. Companies can do their own biased auditing all by themselves. They don't need any help. The reason we want to have an external auditor is for independence. And I'm arguing that we're currently wasting large quantities of money to pay for a fraudulent service. Okay. Um, the problem is bounded awareness. People don't want to see. Okay. You can also think about the Catholic Church, Penn State, and the child abuse scandals. 
And there were undoubtedly some bad people. But there were also undoubtedly some good people who did really bad things because they just didn't fully notice, comprehend, process what many of us would say was shockingly clear information. Okay? Um, loyalty can be a tremendous barrier to noticing when noticing would not be good for our own organization. We also know that people tend to <coughs> only see wrong after the bad outcome occurs. Unfortunately, too often if we wait for the bad outcome to occur, it's already too late. Um, we, we often hear the phrase in, in business or in management, I reward results. Okay. Well, a useful thought question is, if you have an employee who made a really good decision under uncertainty, and it turns out they get a lousy result, do you want to punish them? And my answer is, you shouldn't. Okay. How about if they made a lousy decision and they got lucky? Okay. They took the corporate money, they took it to Las Vegas and bet on black, and it turned out black. Okay. Do you want to reward them for this? And my answer is no. And what I want to tell you is that we tend to reward based on results, not on process. Okay. And we tend to only blame people for bad behavior when the outcome occurs. Okay. Um, if I was to think about my own nation, it's a, the place a little south of here, um, in 2003, I would argue that we illegally and immorally invaded a country called Iraq. And the American public was generally OK with that, as long as it was going to be an easy victory that ousted Saddam Hussein. When things started to turn bad, we not only were unhappy about the outcome, but now all of a sudden we questioned the morality of the Bush administration, which is kind of interesting because the morality of the decision to invade Iraq hadn't changed at all. The only thing that changed was the outcome that was occurring. Slippery slope. Um, I'll, for those of you who are coming to tomorrow's talk, I'll talk a little bit more about slippery slope tomorrow. But the short version is that often other people's ethics doesn't erode by falling off of a cliff, but it gets slowly worse over time. So I'm now making up a story. So you, I do not read this as empirical evidence. Imagine that <coughs> Enron did not go from being an honest company to a crooked company starting on January 23rd, 1997. But rather what occurred was that they became increasingly more unethical over time. Okay. And you're Arthur Anderson, and your job is to audit their books. And one year, they're doing some things that aren't optimal, but they're not illegal. So you sign the books, and you say, clean it up next year. And the next year, they not only didn't clean it up, but now they're into the gray area of illegal action, but not something that the feds ever prosecute. But if you don't sign it now, you'd have to admit that you blew it last year. So you sign it again, and you say, you really need to clean this up next year. Next year, they're clearly acting illegally, but it's very unlikely that anyone else would notice. Again, you have this problem. So you, you kind of get the story. We could easily approve things that are only one notch worse than what we did last period, and that can lead us into a whole lot of trouble. OK, and then I'm going to spend a little bit more time on indirect blindness <clears throat> in judging unethical behavior. Um, and the quick, quick punchline here is that we tend to not hold people culpable when they do their dirty work through others. Okay. So a little bit of background. Um, <coughs> I assume some of you have seen this before. This is among the most famous problems in philosophy. To the philosophers, I, I hope to show you something new before I get to the end of this talk. Um, <clears throat> but here's your problem. You have a trolley coming down this track, and if you do nothing, it's going to run over those five people and kill them in an instant painless death. Now you're this person in blue, and you have the option of turning the switch. If you turn the switch, the trolley will move on to the upper track. You will save those five people, but you will 
cause that person on the upper track to die a quick and painless death. There are no legal implications here. You just need to decide, do you switch or not? You have another four seconds. All right. Now, what I can tell you is that most people and slightly even more business school students switch. Okay. So most people switch. And the more economics training, the more they're likely to switch. Okay. <clears throat> and this is quite consistent with what philosophers might call utilitarian thought. And in this bottom problem, I need to describe this a little bit better because my graphics aren't all that great. But you're this person in blue again. Trolley's going to come down the track. And if you do nothing, these five people, they're toast again. This time, the person next to you, you can't tell by the way it's drawn, but that's actually a large person looking over the bridge with a big backpack on their back. And your option this time is to give them a gentle push. <laughs> they will land on the track with probability 100%. The trolley will hit them and kill them in a quick, painless death and turn them into what's technically called a trolley stopper. <laughs> and those five people will be saved. There are no legal implications. Do you push? OK. You said no? Just like that. OK. So first of all, um, people always want to know about my morality. I'm a switcher and I'm a pusher. <laughs> OK. All right. I'm not asking you to endorse that. I'm just telling you what I am. All right. So the, what I think is interesting is that the bottom problem crea creates what Immanuel Kant would call deontological thought. Okay? And the majority of people say, don't do it. Okay? I personally have a hard time being inconsistent between the two. I'm not arguing that you have to have a hard time. I, I'm sure you can, you can explain yourself. Okay? But you're going to have to justify a net change of four lives over whether you go like that or like that. Because just about everything else that I provide in the problem is the same. Okay? So Now, even more interestingly, my colleague um, at, uh, in Harvard Psychology, Josh Green, who's a, a he's trained uh, as a philosopher, and he's now kind of more of a neurosocial psychologist who studies philo philosophical problems. Um, he does neuroimaging research, so he puts people in brain scanners. And um, for those of you who know nothing about neuroimaging, we scientists actually have a pretty good idea of what goes on in different regions of the brain, and. The amazing result that Josh and his colleagues have found is that these two problems aren't even processed in the same part of the brain. Okay, now, if I was a sophisticated person, I would give you the names of the brain regions and things like that. But I find it more useful to tell you that this part gets processed in the part of the brain that does analytic thinking. And this problem gets processed in the part of the brain that does emotive thought. Okay? So we, we have two different brain functions going on to explain the difference between these two. OK. So now I kind of left the world of reality quite a bit. Um, that's OK. Trolley land's a very nice place. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and Josh um, came to Harvard as a new assistant professor in the fall of 2005. And, um, and I knew his work, but it, um, like lots of faculty members, it, it took me a while to realize I should do something. So, and it wasn't until March that I um, invited uh, Josh to go to lunch. And, um, and we went to a restaurant called Tamarind Bay, which is an Indian, very good Indian restaurant in Harvard Square, which seems to be where I always meet Josh Green over the last seven years now. And, um, and we met on the 14th of March. And two days earlier, I read this article. So I, I knew about Josh's work on Trolley Land. And this article is in the New York Times. And what this article describes 
is a problem that Merck had. Merck had a couple of slow moving drugs that had, I got caught in my wire there, that had limited markets. Yeah, I'm good. Um, that had limited markets, had loyal customers who would pay a lot more for the drug than they were currently charging. The only problem is that the market wasn't that big, and if you raise the price on cancer patients, they would pay more, but with a small market, you wouldn't get that many extra dollars, and you would get a lot of bad press. So the question is, what do you do? And turns out that there's a company just west of Chicago named Ovation, and they help you solve these problems. They buy the intellectual rights from you, and soon after they buy them, they raise the price of the drug by 1,000%. And then when the public gets mad at Ovation, Ovation is less concerned than Merck because they don't have a reputation to be destroyed. Okay. Now you might think, well, certainly Ovation has, I mean, that Merck has the right to get a slow-moving product out of its distribution chain. But I should also mention, at least at the point of this story, Ovation didn't have the facilities to make drugs all by itself. So if you sell the intellectual rights to Ovation, you also sign a contract agreeing to manufacture and supply the drug for an extended period of time. So the question is, what is the role of Ovation? Is it their excellent sales force? That's really silly. Merck had a really good sales force. Okay. The purpose is to hide this behavior from the consumer. So we were interested in testing that. So here's our exper experimental version of this question. <coughs> a pharmaceutical company acts as a cancer drug that was minimally profitable. The fixed costs were high and the market was limited, but patients who used the drug really needed it. The pharmaceutical was making the drug for $2.50 a pill and was selling it for $3 a pill. So we had two groups, two different groups of people. One group was asked to rate how, how unethical it, it would be for the pharmaceutical to raise the price from $3 to $9 themselves. Okay. Another group of people, so this is uh, what I'm showing you so far is what psychologists would call a between subjects condition or a separate condition, reads that the major pharmaceutical sold the rights to a smaller pharmaceutical in order to recoup the costs. The company Y, the smaller pharmaceutical, in prices, increases the price to $15. And what we find is that where, where 10 is very unethical on a 0 to 10 scale, that people rate the direct increase to be far more unethical than the indirect to 15. Okay? So basically, the story that I just told you, this suggests that Mark is, is probably right. Okay? Not, not right as in morally right, right as in their hypothesis that they can avoid blame. Um, that's probably right. So what we did next was we asked a third group of people, which of these is more ethical or more unethical? Okay. And what we find is that when we ask people to compare the two, rather than having two different groups separately rate the two, now the transparency becomes quite clear, and now people rate B as more unethical than A. I should also tell you, I do a fair amount of work for pharmaceuticals. I'm not against pharmaceuticals making money. Um, <coughs> I'm agnostic on the question of whether high prices are appropriate for, um, for orphan drugs. But I'm quite clear that I think that what Merck did is sleazy, okay, in terms of the lack of transparency of what they did um, in this story. Um, <coughs> and that we see that if people understood that, they would be more likely to act in an ethically appropriate way. All right. So back to Trolleyland, um, which is a place I obviously like. <coughs> and I want you to <coughs> imagine that on that top chart, I would have redrawn it, but I didn't get around to it. I want you to imagine in the top chart that there's only three people on the lower track, but we're keeping five people down here. <coughs> OK? And what we're going to do next is that we're going to run an experiment with three different groups. 
And the, the first problem is a lot like the original one I asked you, and that is do you turn the switch to save three, okay, but you'll kill one, okay? The second problem is exactly the trolley stopper problem that I showed you before. Okay, do you push to save five? Okay. And then the problem that I think is interesting here is that another group was given the question of there are actually two trolleys coming down two separate tracks. And you have the time to take one of two actions or you can take neither. You, can, you have time to go turn a switch to the left or you have time to go push to the right. Okay. So you can basically switch for three, push for five, or do nothing. Everybody with me? Okay, I'm, sorry, I'm trying to challenge you, the, the non-pusher over there. Okay. Um, and so here's the results. Okay. First of all, people don't care much whether they're saving three or five. Seventy-six percent are switching for three. Okay. And for reasons that I don't know, this, this 41 is a high percentage. So we got 41 percent pushers in this sample, okay, which is, again, on the high side. But what we're really interested, so you, you see people are more willing to switch for three than to push for five. We're kind of violating utilitarian thought based on the ontological concerns. But what happens when you pit them right against each other? And when you do that, now all of a sudden, pushing for five becomes more popular because the transparency of the action becomes clearer and utilitarian thought becomes more popular. Okay. In tomorrow's talk, I'm going to be talking about how to use this exact same tool to largely wipe out gender discrimination. Okay. So we think that we have a tool here on how to get people out of evaluating one option at a time into two options at a time that lead to more rational and more moral thought. I'm not claiming that this is more moral thought. Some of you have a problem with that pushing action. Um, but I'm going to claim that, that we, from other domains that thinking about multiple options at a time or what we call joint decision making leads to more reflective and more moral thought. Okay, um, the final thing I want to highlight is sort of my quick and dirty view of ethics education, okay? And um, looking at this crowd, there are many of you who, you know, you were, you were a young person when, I, when, um, when Enron collapsed. But what I can tell you is that before Enron collapsed, business schools in large part ignored the topic of ethics, okay? Some business schools had one, one person um, uh, who perhaps taught an elective course on ethics. Enron collapses. A bunch of other firms have massive scandals soon after. And the world tells business schools, you need to do something about these bad people you created. <laughs> okay. And the problem was we didn't know what to do. So business schools started working on what to do. Okay. And uh, one thing that we did was we uh, preached. We told people, you should behave better, okay? which is probably a good idea. You, you should behave better. Okay, um, sort of another thing that we did was we exposed students to 30 case studies and had them talk about it, okay? And I'm not against that, but notice that if we're going to give you a case and ask you what the right thing to do is, we're giving you a deliberative problem where we're telling you that this is an ethics problem. And what I'm suggesting is that we have no idea what to do about the few bad apples that, are, that may be in our community. No idea at all. But I think we know a lot about what to do about the 95 or 98 percent of the folks in our community who have every intention of being a pretty good person, but just happen to do bad things on a fairly regular basis. Okay? And what I'm arguing is that the material that I've talked about over the last 50 some minutes has to do with behaviors that many of the people in this room have been guilty of, not because you're bad people, but because you're human, and humans do bad things without noticing that you're doing anything wrong whatsoever. 
And to the extent that we can identify what are, the, what are these behaviors that people would want to avoid with more self-reflection, I think we have a fundamentally different direction, a direction that's more relevant <coughs> to the vast community of our students, whereas the, the uh, sort of trying to deal with the few bad apples who are doing truly grotesque things on an intentional basis, one, we don't know how to fix them, and those messages are largely irrelevant to the large number of good people who we interact with on a regular basis. So those are some ideas. Um, uh, I, I think most of you are here out of your own free will. So thank you for spending the afternoon uh, with me. <laughs>